Yeah, excellent. So good morning and welcome to the second of the Growing Veg All Year Round workshops. Um, delighted to, to see you guys here. Some familiar faces, some uh, some new faces, I think. It, it's nice to um, nice to have a, a community of, of growers, whether you're next door or, or further afield. It's a, it's a nice thing to know there's other people, other people like us as well. Um, this session is all about um, where we are in the year right now, what we have been up to, how it's gone, um, what we're eating at the moment, what we're planting at the moment, what we're sowing, um, looking forward to the rest of the year and kind of thinking about what we're preparing for and all the rest of that. But I also really want to hear how it's been going for you, what you've been up to, what's going well, what you're eating, um, what you're not quite getting right, you know, all of that, that kind of stuff. So that's the, that's the point of it. Um, there is an announcement from the LAG Learning Center. Um, they wanted me to, to share two workshops with you um, that they're running that we think might be of interest to people. So one they wanted me to plug is the 22nd of June called Love Food, Hate Waste. And the other one on the 27th of June, Climate Aware Food Choices, which are both related to you know, what we're thinking about here. And um, there's loads and loads of excellent courses they do. They're all on the website. Um, have a look at what's there. I think they're, they're bookable through Eventbrite, so lots of stuff should come up. Um, any questions, email the LAG Learning Center directly. They're a lovely bunch, and it's really nice to, to be doing this kind of stuff. So lots, lots of interesting stuff coming up. Um, right, so successional growing. Last time we talked a lot about sort of the basics of how we grow, what we do, what we're aiming for, what our space is like, and, and so on. I'm not going to rehash that. And today I really want to talk to you about how so the practicalities of what we do. So one of the things um, we've been thinking about a lot is how up here in the Highlands, in our particular corner of the Highlands, where we're more sheltered than a lot of people, but we're more exposed than people down south and so on. There's, ne there's ever a lasting light and darkness and, you know, all, the, all our local things. For us, our growing year is really divided into three seasons. So I, I kind of think of spring and summer as a, as a one hour, and I think of spring and summer as May to September. It's, it's our main sort of primary growing season. It's the kind of, uh, kind of time that when you're starting out with gardening, that's when it all happens. That's, that's what it's all about. That's what the books tell you about, you know, sow things in, <laughs> in, in real spring so that you have food in the happy warm season. And that's sort of our, our first thing. And most people, if they've grown for a little while, are okay with that. You're okay sowing things in spring, you're okay doing your tomatoes and all the rest of that, and that's fine. But then what happens the rest of the year? So for us, we think of autumn as October to December. So Christmas is sort of our, our turning point, and winter as January to April. And it's less to do with the actual meteorological season and more to do with what we're harvesting and what garden tasks we're doing. So for me, in autumn, October to December, um, the soil is still going to be warmish because here we don't tend to get massive frosts until the new year. So in terms of how the garden behaves, it's still more like September than like February, if that makes sense. So in autumn, I want to be eating things up until Christmas and I want to be going out on Christmas morning, fetching my kale and spuds and a million other things. And so thinking about autumn is all about how to, what to sow and what to grow so that I have food then. And it's mainly about fresh fruit that I can still be harvesting. And then it gets very dark and it gets very cold and everything gets very, very difficult from January, February into March. And it, it's, it's for us, I think it's the temperature and the light that really mess with, with everything. We don't tend to get a lot of snow where we are specifically, although this winter we've had our fair share of it. But in most years, we can reliably grow kale and spinach and chard outside um, and harvest it every year, but it goes very, very dormant. Um, so something we do for winter is that the crops we plant for winter, we plant very close together and we grow a million of them. So instead of growing five kales and thinking they're going to get massive and they're going to be really happy, we grow maybe 20 close together like lettuce so that we have a lot of smaller leaves coming up throughout the dark season. Um, and then when the light returns, starting at some point in February and the weather warms up a bit, things get going again and those overwintered plants really wake up. Um, we'll also be eating a lot of frozen things and other put up things. And the first of the, the new sowings 
my sorry um the first of the new sewings might just about get going in april so we might be eating the first lettuces the first radishes and so on but it's mainly older stuff so for us um if i close the door he'll whine even more i'm really sorry um for us the the year is a is a, is a sort of three season thing i think spring and summer autumn and winter and it's all to do with our, our tasks and how the garden and the plants behave if, if that makes sense and the, the the specific timings vary depending on where you are if you're on the south coast it's going to be quite a different beast and if you're in france then you know you're going to have really hot summers and summer and spring are a massively different thing but for us this year in particular it went from winter to what we have now which i think is summer because this is as warm as it's going to get so you know the plants aren't necessarily ready yet we're not harvesting tomatoes but this is what it's going to be doing for the next you know two or three months if we're lucky it's going to keep doing this so to me spring and summer are kind of morphed into one so that, that was that was one point i was going to make think about your seasons how seasons play out where you are and how your plants and your garden behaves at that time, I suspect. And how you behave, what your year is like, if you have the kind of job where summer is your really busy season, but you're less busy in the winter, then that affects how much time you can spend on your garden. But if summer is a quiet period for you, you've got lots of time to prepare for winter and so on. So it's think about how, um, when you are able to, to put time and effort in it as well, and how to make use of the times when your life is maybe a bit, a bit slower and a bit quieter. Um, the, 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 the next part is I want to throw a few sort of questions and things to think about at you so you can sort of mold them over in, in thinking about how to how to grow all year round. So the, the first of them is what do you want to eat and when do you want to be eating it? So are you the kind of person who wants steady, reliable greens all year round? Are you someone who just wants the glut of raspberries and tomatoes when they're ready? Are you someone who's very keen to put up cabbages and eat pickled things, you know, in November and whatever it is? Or are you a bit of everything? And there's no right and wrong answer to this. It's all about thinking, do you want to eat your stuff fresh? Do you want to eat your stuff frozen? Do you want to eat your stuff canned? You know, do you want to eat jams? What, what is it you you're really hoping to to do and you're hoping to to eat for us peas never make it into the house we practically only ever get eaten in the garden no matter how many we grow and because we've learned that we can have leafy greens reliably all year round outside and in the tunnel um, we don't bother freezing things like spinach anymore because we know there's always fresh and so for us it's about sowing regularly so that there's always a supply of that kind of thing um, and that's to do with what we eat and when we want to be eating it. But we know that we eat jam all the time. So a big task for us in the summer months is to either freeze things or do stuff with it straight away. And um, we've just run out of the last um, Rowan, what was it? Rowan, rosehip and apple jelly. And it was absolutely amazing. And I'm sad to see it go. Um, so this year we have to make more of it because it's lasted until now and I really, really want more. Um, we also make um, our own booze, we make hetero wines. So from about now on we're, we're, we're brewing kind of every week and there's never enough because you end up sharing it with people and so on. So for us the year is both about what, what we're wanting to be eating fresh and how much of it we can actually cope with at that point. But also what we want to do with the things and what do I want to be eating in November? What do I want to be eating on Christmas Day? Um, what do I want to be eating on really miserable February days? And to think about how to manage that and what to grow so that I have enough for eating fresh and for putting up and learning the skills that go with that kind of thing. So it's about fresh and preservation and, and, and so on. So what do you want to eat? What do you want to be eating when? Or all the rest of that, think about that. And the second point to, to think about is what grows reliably for you? So what is the thing you can grow in your sleep? What is the thing you don't really have to be thinking about? What is the thing that always does well for you? Um, for us, kale, <laughs> I keep going on about kale, but it really is our, our always crop because we really don't have to think about it. We could probably scatter the seed and it would do well. And it's really reassuring to know that there'll always be some kale and I don't have to worry about that. Um, raspberries tend to be a really reliable one for us because we've given them a lot of space and they tend to be very happy in our climate here. And we're looking forward to that every year. Um, and we finally have enough 
rhubarb for our needs, which I've never managed before. So I think from now on, rhubarb is going to be a reliable crop and we eat masses of the stuff and we put it up and we turn it into ketchup and wine and all sorts. So to say we have enough, we have about 15 plants now or something. So it's <laughs> so but it took a while, it took a while to get there and figure out what we do. Um, and, and think about your space and how much space you want to give over to things. Um, we grow things like potatoes and carrots, but we know we can never grow enough to actually meet our needs in that. So they're just sort of a little add-on crop. They're something we enjoy and, you know, we, we eat it when it's there, but I wouldn't give over half my space to something like that. I'd rather grow kohlrabi and broccoli and whatever, things like that. Um, with some crops like broccoli and uh, cauliflower, we've learned that some years we've got them coming out of our ears, some years we get none. So we've made our peace with that because the, the temptation, you know, the, the the one perfect broccoli dangling there is enough to make us grow it again and give over space to it. So we've learned to enjoy the leaves and the stems and to find other ways um, to use the crops when they don't work out. And we've learned that the thing we really love about broccoli is both the texture and the crunch and the taste. And one of the ways to mimic that is by letting all our brassicas go to go to flower in the spring and cutting off the, the leafy buds and eating that. So even though we didn't grow, I think, a single decent broccoli last year, we had one, I think, but it wasn't it wasn't great. Um, at this point in the year, so last year, I really missed it. And I, I we, we had some frozen broccoli, which I was grateful for, but we didn't do enough the year before. So it's, it's this timeline thing. But at this point in the year, I feel like I've eaten masses of broccoli because every day we're snacking on the, the unopened flower buds and I'm less panicked about it. And like Vicky, we have a million broccolis and they're doing really well. So I'm, I'm delighted about that. So a lot of them will be frozen so that, you know, when I miss them in October, there'll be broccoli. But it's about thinking, what are you, what comes easily to you? What growing and preparation do you find easy? What do you find hard? And kind of think about that. Yeah, spinach still growing from last year so much. Everything I'm going to show you, most of it is, is, is stuff will still going. So think about what 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 doesn't require a lot of brain power for you to actually actually do. Um, the third one is to think about your light and temperature. Um, I, so most of you will be in the Highlands, but I think not everyone is. So. When does the light tip over? When is that moment when you think, ah, oh, we're going to be okay? And I didn't, I didn't really mean the last frost date, but more the point when you think there's enough light and warmth for the plants to get going now. So at what point are your overwintered things in the ground going to wake up and think, oh, it's, it, it's spring and we're going to get going. So to have a think about spring and autumn and when those tipping points are specifically for you, keep an eye out on that this season to see um there, there comes a point in autumn and for us it's usually it's not quite the solstice but it's some somewhere late September beginning of October when any new plantings that I put in in September aren't going to put on any growth anymore and there's just they're just going to sit there dormant um so I have to plant them early enough in like August for them to still go get going but not so late that they're already massive and they're going to want to flower so it's, it's this fine balance of and it's to do with light and temperature so think about how that works specifically where you are what the wind is like are there you know is there, is there always a month when the wind comes from the other side and messes everything up and so think about your your environment I suppose um the next one is to think about your space and infrastructure. And that is, I mean, both outside and inside. Last time we talked a lot about your garden space and what kind of beds you might have and where to where to grow things and hedges and, and all, all the rest of it. But I also mean the, the infrastructure in your house and in your life. So do you have larder space to store things? Do you have a giant freezer? Um, do you have room to put things up? Do you have space for jam jars? You know, all of that kind of stuff. Do you have time in the week to be cooking a million jams? Um, are there other things you're not doing that you'd rather be doing instead? And so it, I, I use infrastructure as a, as a sort of catch-all term for both the garden, the house and yourself to think about that. So in our case, um, we're lucky we have, we have a bit of space in the house. So the, the, the pointless downstairs back room which was the doctor's surgery for most of the 20th century, but it's a small room, it's too small for a bedroom or an office or anything. Um, so that's now become a dedicated larder space and we've committed to that. We've put shelves in and um, fridges and so on because we've been doing this for, for years now and we know 
we're going to get through it all. And as you can imagine, home brewing takes up a lot of space because you're forever half the year you're drowning in empty bottles, the other half the year you're drowning in full bottles and you need space for that kind of stuff. So because of our life and how we live, we've been able to give over space to that. But not everyone can do that. And you might have, you know, home offices or children or whatever other things you home businesses and so on. So it's to think about what you can actually do. Um, we also, when our fridge died, we consciously, after much going back and forth, we bought one of those American style double things because the left-hand side is a tall freezer and having a tall upright freezer made it a lot easier for us to access our frozen things and made it a much more likely that we're actually gonna eat it. So for us, that was the right choice. Whereas a, a chest freezer, I know I'm gonna lose stuff and I'm never gonna see it again. So it's, it's to think of, and again, that's something that worked for us and for our life, but it wouldn't work for other people. So it's to think about your life and your infrastructure and your need, um, where you're gonna store things. Um, we have kitchen cabinets from the 1950s that come with built-in cool storage. So a lot of our jam just lives in there. It doesn't, it's still in the kitchen, but it's not, you know, in a fridge or anything and it works out just fine. But it's to think about your space and what you're, what you're doing with it. and how much you can put up and what you're going to do with all those tomatoes if, if, if they work out. Um, uh, another point is to think about um, people around you who are growing all year round or who are growing the kind of things you want to be growing and reach out to them and talk to them. Ask them what they're doing, when they're doing it, specifically, you know, when are you sowing that thing, when you're planting it out, when do you harvest that, what do you do with it once you find, you know, all of those kind of things that Sound like a really obvious things, but I think so many of us don't really have these conversations with our neighbors anymore. Specifically, if you live in a place that you, you haven't grown up in, you don't really have those networks. So peek over garden fences and talk to the gardeners around you because pretty much everyone is happy to chat about it and will want to tell you about the amazing whatever thing they've made. And, you know, I, I send everyone away with, with tastes of brassica flowers because it's just, it's mind blowing and they all think I'm nuts, but it's a, it's a good thing to be doing. So talk to other people and see what they're doing when specifically very local to where you are. Um, and my final point in this, this long list of things to throw at you is knowing what to sow when. So I'm going to hold up my, my sewing schedule again, um, which is on the, the Highland Seedlings website under resources. And it's a spreadsheet that I've made for myself that you can edit um, where I've made a note of what I'd like to sow when so that I have food all year round and it's color coded. Um, to tell me what to sow for autumn, for spring, for winter, and, and, and so on. Um, I don't stick to it, <laughs> we were saying this earlier. Um, I, I have every intention of sticking to it, and then I get to about May and everything goes out the window. Um, but by then, I know I have a vague idea of what the year is going to be like in weather-wise, what the year is going to be like for me, um, what is done really well and I don't need more of what has not worked well first time around, I do need more of. And it's sort of a reminder to keep sowing. So it's a reminder to keep sowing radishes, lettuces, kale, whatever, regularly, little and often, so that there's food all year round. So at the moment, <laughs> happens. Um, so I'm, because I, we've been very lax in our sowing, between the, the, the millions of plants going out and us redesigning the museum in Newton Moor, it's just sort of overtaken our lives this winter. It's been totally, delightfully bonkers. Um, which means our, our next succession is looking a bit ropey. Um, so at the moment, I, I, I'm looking to be sowing things from, I think, the second half of May and the first half of June. So I'm looking at, I was going to sow more beans, but the first lot have done really well. So I'm trusting the beans that we've already done are going to be good. Um, time for more beetroot, yep. Yeah. Um, time for a lot of brassicas, um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts and cabbage. I'm going to be sowing them now so that I can harvest them in winter. Um, hopefully like next February, March, April, if it goes well, um, I'm going to be sowing them now and they're going to be ready to plant out maybe in July, maybe in August, depending on the weather, that kind of thing. Um, probably time to do more carrots, um, chard, there's always, always time for chard. Um, I'm going to probably do more kale and kohlrabi. The first lots are being really nice. The plants are maybe this big in the ground. So we're, we're eating older ones, but we could eat those that we didn't have any others. But I think for the next lot of that, we can definitely get another sowing or two in of that. Um, I'm probably gonna be doing more lettuce, you know, that kind of thing. 
um, maybe not a lot of, of spring onions, so small onions that you're not going to want big, um, which we eat specifically for the green. I'm, I'm less bothered about the white bits, but I love I love onion green and it freezes really well. So we chuck in spring onions into pretty much every gap we find. Um, more radishes. And if I can be bothered sweet and turnip, though, so every year we, we, we're a bit indifferent about them. So I don't know if this is going to be a sweet and turnip year. But I, I'm basically thinking about um, sort of autumn and winter. What, what are we going to be eating and what, what are we making a start on? So the, the sewing schedule is a, is a guide, but the idea is that you go and and make up your own that takes into account your life, your climate, your space and and so on, just as a sort of little reminder of, oh, I could be sewing some things. And, you know, if I not manage it this week or next week, it doesn't matter. It can catch up and the plants will be fine. Um, so that, that's my talking at you part. Um, and, and we're now over to the showing you things. If we if we were in person, I would I would pass you lovely things and you could try and eat them and, and all the rest of that. So you're going to have to imagine that part. I'm very sorry, but I'm going to hold them up for you um, so you can at least see them. So this morning, Seamus and I went around the garden and the grow houses just to pick up a selection of things that we're eating at the moment, just to show you how the succession of sowing works out for us. So even in a year with a really crappy long winter, this is the kind of stuff we, we're eating at the moment. And I brought in a few plants just to show you what size there are at the moment. So here's a, that's a chili. That's how big it is. Um, I'm going to be topping it very soon. I'm going to be cutting off the top so that it goes bushier. And we're about to plant these into pots, maybe this size, to put on windowsills and grow them on. And hopefully they're going to flower and fruit this year. And then we'll keep them as house plants and flower and fruit again next year. So that, that's sort of the size of our chilies, peppers, aubergines at the moment. Some are in the ground in the grow house and they're a bit bigger, but by and large, they're this kind of head hide. Um, we have a lot of tomatoes. This is a fairly medium sized one. So a lot of them are already in the ground in the polytunnel. Um, there are some taller ones, there are some smaller ones, but that's sort of what our tomatoes are like at the moment. Um, the ones in the polytunnel are starting to flower now, which is, is reassuring, but we still have a, a million of them left. And I'm very happy with that for this time of year. That's a, that's a decent tomato for how our year works out. We don't have a heated greenhouse or anything like that. So that's okay. And then I've brought a few plugs for you. This is a, a red Russian kale. I grow them in these plugs. You can see they've got really nice roots. When they're like this, they, they pop out of their, uh, their compartments very easily. And I just pop them in the ground like this. That plant is big and sturdy enough to, to survive. And I could, I could eat the first leaves fairly soon. And we generally hope that plants are going to be this big by the time we plant them on. So that's a, sort of this size. That's a very happy one. But it can also stay in its pod for another week or two if I don't get around to planting it out. These are spring onions, onions grown from seed rather than from set. So they're like this now. They're, that, that's my finger in, in comparison. So they're all three of them are maybe a, a pinky, that kind of size. So they're, they're going to grow in the ground. I will grow them together like that, all three of them, and then twist one out when it's the size I want. There we go. And we'll just fill any gaps with that. Um, here's a runner bean. It's a small runner bean. A lot of them are, <laughs> the ones we haven't put out yet, are much bigger and they're desperate to go out. I thought I'd grab a small one for you. Um, it's going well, but they've grown so quickly that you're definitely in time to sow more, I think. Um, beans are, for us, beans are, 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 are summer, but also an autumn food. They just keep going forever and we enjoy them a lot. And then this is, this is a, a, a kohlrabi, which had lots of other kohlrabi buddies next to it. So it's grown tall rather than white, but it'll, it'll spread out once it's in the ground. It's, it's at a similar stage to the kale. It looks similar. And with these, you want them to swell up. So when, when I plant them, I'm going to plant it to about here to where the leaves start and then hopefully it's going to get it's going to get going um there we go um so the question in the in the chat bear with me two seconds oh it's not showing me the chat what have i done huh. oh hang on sorry um 
so spring onions and plugs then plant them out yeah i i grow onions in sets but i largely most of them are grown in seeds in plugs and then i plant them out when they're big enough um, and easy enough to handle and i find that this size you know it's already starting to look like a, like a little onion down there um they're going to be fairly easy to handle i can pick them up like this very easily they're not going to break uh, shedding soil everywhere but other than that it's it's totally fine um, and I, I, I grow almost everything in plugs with the exception of carrot and parsnip because I can't keep track of it otherwise because we, we it's, it's a mixture of us growing a lot of things in a lot of different spaces. Um, me having some cognitive issues, which means memory is a very rare commodity and I, I try not to load it up with stuff. So growing it in plugs makes it a lot easier to keep track of things. And also with growing it in plugs, I can, I can see pretty early on if I'm going to have enough of something or not. So once they germinate, I know what germination rate is going to be like, and I can quickly sow some extra ones. But if I've already given over space in the ground, then that's it, somehow that makes it a lot harder for me. And also because we grow so much and we grow all the time, I don't have spa ground space ready when I need to be sowing things because there's still other things in it at that point, if that makes sense. So we're not quite ready to I don't have, but by the time I, when, I, when I sowed these, I didn't have any, any ground available to sow them in, but I had lots of space in the polytunnel. But now that they're ready, some of the older plants have come out and there is space for them. So it's a, again, it's an infrastructure thing, both me and the, and the space. Um, spring onions, all onions are always really slow. Um, these have been growing. Oh, I took, I took the plug out, but I'm going to say late February, beginning of March. Like they, <laughs> they, they, onions are a, a slow thing and you just have to hope that they're going to be doing something eventually. And it's a sort of, if I get to eat them at some point, one of the joys of the succession of growing, when you get it right, you stop worrying about how long things take to grow because you know there's the previous bunch to eat and there's going to be a next bunch and so on. It's to, it's to start trusting your, your schedule that it's going to pay off eventually. Um, Shall I show you the harvest as well? And then we can start having an actual conversation. Okay, so we have a, a trug of greens. And we've just gone around and harvested sort of one of each, not as much as we could have harvested. We tend to not harvest everything in one go unless we have to. We tend to help ourselves every day to the things we're actually going to eat. So we don't have to store them in the fridge or anything. You know, we, we eat what we can. Because it's, <laughs> I know I said it was hot, but because it's not that hot here, um, you can usually leave things in for, you know, a longer period of time than you would be if you lived in an actual warm place. My mother lives in Germany, and if she doesn't harvest things sort of on the day, the next day they've gone over um, because it gets very, very hot. Um, so um, these are in no particular order, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I've got. I have a, a chive and a chive flower. Um, this is quite tough, but the flowers are are a nice thing. I'm going to shove them in here. Um, there's a lot of different herbs here. Hang on. Might come back to more herbs. What have we got? Um, a bunch of herbs. There is um, four or five different kinds of mint. There's sage, thyme and oregano. Um, we always struggle with rosemary. It's starting to, to do stuff, but we've never, never managed to grow that in any kind of quantity but these we know we can rely we can grow reliably and they'll come back every year and we have masses of them so one of our tasks this time of year and when it's warmer is to harvest them regularly and dry them in the kitchen we have a drying rack you know like an old clothes thing in the ceiling and we just hung them in big bunches and then once they're dried we put them in jars um so that we we, we have them but last winter we actually had a decent winter where there was still some herbs outside where but particularly oregano that did very nicely last winter Seamus is nodding so I think we grow them in tires so each tire has a different herb in it there's two stacked on top of each other and um we eat, eat a lot of boring things like mashed potato with some kale thrown in and masses of herbs and it makes it taste amazing so it's a it's a lot of reward for not very much investment and you don't really have to do anything other than make sure they don't take over your garden um here is one of our spinach leaves <laughs> They are completely nuts. They are literally the size of a head, um, both in the tunnel and outside. This is um, something we put in. This is a new plant from this year, 
but our overwintered ones are this size as well. And they're all bolting now because it's so hot. So they're starting to go to flower and the leaves are getting smaller and smaller. But because we eat the stalks as well, it doesn't really bother us. So there's still enough green leafage and we either eat it fresh or cooked. And eventually when we need the space, like for our onions or whatever, we'll, we'll take the plants out and we'll eat what we can. If you want to freeze any green leaves, um, wilt them in a pan until they change colour and um, squeeze the liquid out and then put them in the freezer and that works very nicely. If you freeze them straight away they tend to go mushy and horrible um, but if you wilt them they do better. We tend to um, wilt things with onion and garlic because we know um, whenever we, we cook greens like this onion and garlic is going to be going in so it's half the meal prepared already and um, so it's thinking about again our time and, and think about gi giant spinach, massively happy spinach. Here's a Cavolanero. This is uh, last year's plant from the Polytunnel. Um, they're massive and giant, um, but they didn't do anything until March. They went in as tiny, tiny plants way too late in autumn, and we thought it was all a, a complete waste of time, and then they got going, which is brilliant because the new lot of outdoor kales haven't done anything yet, and the last lot of outdoor kales are starting to bolt, so for once we didn't think we got the timing right, but weirdly it's actually ended up working, working quite nicely. Um, this is a bit of cabbage leaf from a bolted cabbage, so it didn't form a head, but it's forming lots of flower buds, which I love, and, uh, and lots of leaves, which we're still eating. That's still, you know, there's lots of cabbage that we just use like that. Um, I tried to pluck some um, chart and it turns out I picked a, a leaf that was half eaten. I'm very sorry about that. There's lots of beautiful ones. They all start, this is an old one, so they're starting to bold, but I'm not going to be bothered by that. I'm going to eat that anyway. Um, but chard is, is an ongoing thing. Sometimes when we, when it's starting to bold, we cut it back more or less to ground level and it keeps going and grows small ones again. Like kale, it's worth trying in case you get one that's, that, that, that is semi-perennial in this climate. I don't think this is something that works elsewhere but for some reason a mixture of of grey warmish and drizzle um, turns them into semi-perennials which is a it's quite a rewarding thing. Um, this is it's chard or beetroot leaves I can't remember but we eat them as leaves. Um, this is I think it's a chard that's growing new leaves again higher up the stem but if we, we cut them back they'd grow small leaves at the bottom of the stem and get going. Um, this is the top of a broad bean. Our broad beans are flowering. They're very happy. So the really sturdy ones, I cut the top off um, and eat the leaves because they taste like broad beans and it tides me over until the broad beans are ready. I love the flavor. I enjoy eating them raw and that tastes the same. Um, that's a bolting lamb's lettuce. It was a, a, a spring sowing this year, um, but it didn't like the heat in the tunnel. So it's bolting. So we're going to have to eat them all very, very soon because it's got a flower bud coming, or leave them to, to get the seeds, obviously. There's a lot of random lettuce bits, big and small. Um, these come from a polytunnel, but our outside ones are already harvestable as well. So we, we always have a, a lot of different lettuces going on. Um, it's a beautiful kale leaf. It's pretty, and it's going to taste amazing, and it's there's lots of it everywhere. Um, here's a, a sample radish. This is an, an outside one. That's a pretty nice one. Um, here's a, a radish flower. So it's the top of the radishes that are bolting. Um, I'm going to eat that. Here's a, a couple of the, the amazing brassica flowers we already talked about. Um, they're, they're, and they're, they're just a bit, I could have taken them a bit earlier because they are just about to, to open, but I'm going to eat a bit of that. I just can't resist these. Mm. Perfect. Perfect. Rocket. Rocket has been our, our stunning crop this year. We are drowning in the stuff. We've made so much pesto. We've got it coming out of our larder. But it's just, but it's such a wonderful thing. It tastes amazing. And this, this particular one is going to flower. And it was, this one would have been planted out last September, maybe. I would reckon so sowed in beginning of August, I would think. Um, and it's done us, done us nicely. There's rhubarb, <laughs> the aforementioned rhubarb. This is quite a thin one, but we have it in all shapes and sizes and I can't get enough of it. Um, 
leek. I know everyone eats leek sort of in winter. For us, leek is always an early summer crop, which sounds ridiculous. Um, but they only really fatten up now. We, the other day we plucked one and it was a, a, the giantest leek I've ever seen. It was amazing. And they're just starting, we're plugging them now because they're starting to go to flower. So the scapes are coming up, so that's it. And we're going to be chopping them into, into really thin bits and freezing them. And that's it. And then we're going to have lots of leek all year round. And we eat quite a bit of the green, not when it gets really tough, but pretty, pretty high up. So a lot of the leeks, leaves as well. Beautiful, beautiful leek. Um, these would have been sold last April, I think, planted out in June, July, and we're now eating them. So it's a it's a really frustrating thing when you're waiting for your first lot of leeks. But when you're in the in the cycle of leeks, it doesn't matter because there's always some in the freezer and they taste the same as, as fresh for how we use them. So that's gone, that's gone well. Um, celery same story as the leek it was sold last spring i think in in march and it's finally turned its celery. last year it, it just didn't grow much but this year it's finally bunches and bunches of celery so we're going to dry some of it and it's going to do us do us forever um and then there's an asparagus um i know in england um asparagus time is you know late april for six weeks for us asparagus is a May if we're lucky, but usually a June thing. And um, they're very welcome. And every year we plant more because there's ever enough. And I really hope to be drowning in it in about three years' time. Um, and we never, we've never ever preserved it because there's never enough um, yet. So we just eat it fresh. And I love eating it raw as well. Um, I just can't get enough of it. And the, the final couple of things I've brought you are scapes. So the, the flower stalks, this is a leek one. It's massive. It's really thick. Um, it tastes sweet and oniony and delightful. We chop them very finely and just wilt them in the pan and they just open up and they are delightful things. And you can freeze them once you, either like this or once you've wilted them. And then this is the much prized garlic scape. The first ones, they're really early this year. They're usually a bit later for us, but they are the sweetest, sweetest thing. They, When you wilt them in the pan, they sort of taste like roast garlic and they're just amazingly wonderful things and it's like asparagus it's something we really 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 look forward to every year um so once we normally leave them a bit longer until they're a bit taller but i wanted to show you escape and we cut them off and then we think the garlic usually takes another two three weeks afterwards which would be very early this year we've never had garlic this early so but I think the, the recent hot spell has really helped with it. So anyway, that's that's a sort of cursory roundup of what's ready. We have no fruit yet. Um, nothing's ready. Lots of things are flowering. The fruit trees have started to put on fruit, but nothing's ready. Strawberries aren't ready yet because they're outside. They're not in the tunnel. Um, but that's that's still a big, a whole lot of a whole lot of food. And when we had the last workshop, I wouldn't have been able to give you this much variety, but I, I would have been able to bring you quite a lot of just amount of food, you know, still quite a lot of things we were going to eat that day. Um, in the winter, we're not eating masses of, of things every day. So the, the put up stuff really helps. But last night we were having a, a sort of potato thing with cooked spinach. And we just had like two handfuls of our spinach, but I think it was probably the equivalent of two of those bags you buy in the shop. It's probably like a fiver of spinach and it felt like no effort and no space. And, and now I'm going to stop talking. And I'm gonna, gonna, gonna uh, leave it to you um, and see how we are. So Shems, are you okay to sort of wrangle questions and things like that and, and, and join in as well? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of the face of it, but you do most of the hard work, so. You know. Oh, that, that's just nonsense. I, I'm just the brawn. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's it's really interesting seeing all the stuff that that Mari was just holding up. Um, but the the vast majority was planted last year, and and I, I remember over winter thinking, ah, oh, these are never going to turn into anything, are they? And now we're we're drowning in them. The the the, the big polytunnel that that a lot of these came from is a jungle of stuff, and it's absolutely amazing um so it's we, yeah it's, we had kind of plant the, the the amount we planted was with running our free food stall in mind so last year we ran a free food stall every saturday morning in june july august september maybe end, end of may but this year because we're constantly at the at the museum um we've not had the the energy to do it and because spring was so delayed spring um because of the weather and um, there wasn't enough 
to share early on. Now we'd have lots to share, but we don't have the energy to do it. So our hope for the, the community garden around the back is that next year, um, it'll be the volunteers sharing it rather than us every Saturday and, and things like that. So we, we, have, an, we have too much for us. Um, so we're, we're thinking creatively about ways to, to not let it go to waste or just to the chickens and the rabbit. And Sorry, I'll, I'll stop interrupting. No, no, not at all. Um, we've got some great questions in, in the chat. Uh, Faye's asking, are there any veg tops you can't eat? <laughs> oh, um, I mean, rhubarb is the obvious one, right? That's a, <laughs> that, that goes without saying. Um, there's nothing I can think of. There are things I don't really like to eat more than I can't. So I'm fairly indifferent to radish leaves. The, the flower buds are fine. I'm indifferent to things like ground elder and a, a lot of stuff like that. Um, so with the tops, it's mostly a question of taste and not what I can't, what, what I know what I go looking for and I'm excited to eat rather than what I can. So the things that I've been telling you about, I know they agree with me and they, they do fine both cooked and raw. Um, any, any suggestions from, from the audience? Any any plant greens you know you can't eat or you know don't agree with you? I think a, a good rule of thumb is if it looks like a broccoli flower, then you could eat it. <laughs> and that's the amazing thing, they all do. Uh, this has been such a revelation for us growing all this stuff uh, because of course you, you never see this kind of thing in the shops so so unless you're growing it yourself and seeing them develop in this way and if you're leaving the, the veg for, for long enough so it is turning to, to, to flower it's only then that you get this great glorious you know late late harvest of flowers um so for us yeah that, that's been one of the, one of the revelations of, of growing all this stuff for ourselves um that's been been glorious and pea, peas you can eat, you can give them, I think, two or three haircuts and they will still flower. Um, but we tend to grow pea shoots as a separate thing because I, I, I don't remember how often I've cut them. So I, I don't trust myself to. So similarly, if you've got a million broad bean seeds, if you scored on a, a bumper pack, you can grow some just for the tops and eat them as fresh greens. You know, so it's worth thinking about. It's like beetroot, isn't it? Um, beetroot takes a long time to get you a, an actual swollen beetroot. And it's delightful when it works out. But sometimes it doesn't and then you've sort of been waiting for ages but the beetroot leaves taste amazing so we sort of sometimes we grow them close together just for the leaves as a salad crop so it's, it's thinking about thinking creatively about again it comes back to what do you want to be eating and when isn't it and what grows reliably for you and what is worth your time and effort and what what isn't i suppose um do you cook all the broccoli parts or do you eat them raw um yes and yes <laughs> we um we do both um we, we are big fans of, of, of the taste of raw brassica. Um, it's something that I certainly never had growing up. I grew up in a household where everything was cooked to big green mush. And it's one of my delights as an adult to, to have discovered that I didn't really like cooked vegetables as much as I like raw ones. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of vaguely warm in the, in, the, in the pan. You add them at the last second. So they go a little bit warm, but they're still, they're not, my mother wouldn't consider them cooked, right? It's that kind of distinction. Um, and most things, yeah, raw broad beans are just an utter, utter delight. If you, if you skin them twice, if you take the interior skin off as well, they're just, oh, make me so happy. I can't wait soon. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do everything. Um, uh, when do you dry things? How do you do it? Um, I take my bunch of leaves like this. Um, I try to only get leaves from the same thing. Um, I tie a string around them and I tie them to a hook or whatever else high up so they're not going to bother me. And then I have to set myself a timer because <laughs> it's pathetic. Um, so I have to put a, an entry in my calendar like a week later, say check on the mint because otherwise I'm going to leave it for three months and it's going to be terribly dusty and I'll, I'll forget about it. And then once once it's dry, um, and you can tell when it when you sort of rub it between your fingers and it comes apart easily. Um, uh, I'll take a, I'll open a newspaper on the table and I'll, I'll sort of squish it and rub it above that. So I get mostly leaves and not stalks. And then I put them into a, a, a kilner jar and that's it. And there they stay. Um, most of the, we, we, we eat herbs fresh more than dried, but it's always nice to have a, particularly oregano, it's good to have a, 
a steady supply of that because it's the thing we, we eat most of. Um, grown cucumbers, oh, cucumbers are appalling this year. They're just not playing ball at all. Um, they're just horrendous. Cucumbers are always hit and miss for us. We've never had a truly glutful year of them. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, they're, they're on my list of maybe doing a re-sowing. I, I did a full tray, 84 of them, and maybe a third germinated, which is pathetic because they're usually easy to germinate and then they die on me. But so this year the germination rate was awful. It's, it's the weather, you know, they've just not been quite right. And the ones that have germinated are, they're, they're not looking happy. They're, they're going a bit yellow, like my courgettes are as well. So they're, they're desperate to go out, but they're also too small to go out. So I think I might, I might give it a go and, and, and do some more. Um, yours are 20 centimeters. You, you beat us by 18. I think they're just appalling. Um, our peas are just starting to flower and our courgettes are, are finally looking like we might get some courgettes this year. No flowers yet, but they're, they're getting there. Um, sequential sowing, say radish, can you plant in the same compost or do you have to renew? Um, do you mean for starting the seeds? Or for where you grow them outside? I was thinking like um, in a garden tunnel, if you're, um, you know, doing a row and then you're so planting another row say a week later and then another row and so on can yeah. you go back sort of like four weeks later can you go back to the first lot and you've already harvested that can you just plant straight back in on top of that yeah so this is this is one of the one of the the joys of no dig gardening at least how it's worked out for us um our beds we top them up with compost and manure once a year we give them about two three inches of a topping it literally sits on top and that's enough to feed the plants for a full year of, of growing. Um, sometimes we top up in autumn, sometimes we top up literally before we put the new spring plantings out. This year is one of them. So before we plant things out, we top it up and that will feed them and feed them and feed them. And because we do the successional sowing, because they're constantly new things going in, um, that largely takes care of rotation. So we don't keep track of rotations the way you would do with fields because we're constantly rotating throughout the year. So I, I don't tend to put radishes in the spot of radishes, largely because there's, there's something ready, else ready that needs to go in at the same time. So I sort of try and vary things, but not with any kind of rhyme or reason. It's just how it works out. Um, but yeah, the compost should sustain it. And we make fertilizer from nettles, from comfrey, uh, from seaweed if we can be bothered and we're at the sea uh, on a good day. But nettles, comfrey do, do us very nicely. Um, and that helps feed them as well. But most of the time we're lazy and we don't even bother. So the compost we find sustains it well enough, I think. Um, how do you make fertilizer? Um, you get a bucket or a tub or whatever. Um, you cut off the foliage that you're gonna turn into fer fertilizer, your, your nettles, your seaweed, your whatever. Um, you put it in, you top it up with water, um, you wait a week. Um, stir it if you like, if you remember. It goes very smelly and horrible. Um, and there it is. And you dilute it with water. You can't use it straight. It's too strong. Um, so we usually do it sort of one in 10. So one part fertilizer, 10 parts water in a watering can. Um, um, it just sort of keeps going. The dogs like to drink it because I think the smelliness really, I know your, your, your face face says it all, that the, uh, the smell really appeals to them. Um, we, we have an experimental, there's a bucket of apples they were all ones that had fallen off last year and they'd been eaten by things or they weren't right so we put them in a bucket for the chickens to to help themselves with they sort of did and then it rained a lot over winter so now it's apple slush and I'm, I'm wondering if that might make a um a thing as well um Hilary I can see your I was just going to say with comfrey yeah I, I don't add any water at all do you not so I cram it in a bucket yeah um put another put the plant pot with a um on top and uh the bucket the bucket's got a hole in it so i put another solid bucket underneath that will catch mm -hmm. the yeah put a weight on top yeah and it's a lot less smelly that way ah excellent so you're just sort of squeezing it really you, you squeeze it all rots down you you're yeah. you end up with virtually nothing but liquid and yeah. and then you dilute it to a weak sort of tea colour. Yeah, that's um, brilliant and comfy. Like, and you have to when you use it, but yeah. you don't. Have, you've not got 
got it in my garage and it's not bothering me. That's 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 a that's a much happier option, I think, than the the, the smelly the smell. and it's less effort as well. So we're, we're all about doing it with as little effort as possible. So you've got more time to enjoy the the, the fruits of your of your labour as well. That's so you, you put it in a bucket in a bucket with a hole in the bottom, and then put another bucket underneath. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then and then um, something on top with a weight to to squash it down. Okay, it takes a few weeks, but yeah. I've. When did I harvest some comfrey? Probably late April, and I've now got over a litre of concentrate, which will last me all year. There's a lot of wild comfrey in Fern. It's the, if you happen to be near these parts, um, it's, the, it's the, the, the main street that goes through the village past the garage. And it's the it's the it's the street that comes up at the garage to to the back street, and there the, there's a stretch of greenery by a field, and it's full of comfrey. So if you, this time of year you can spot the the little purple flowers and just masses of it there. If you haven't got any in the garden, that's a good spot for it. But nettles and everything else work as well. That's that's a brilliant tip. Thank you. Um, another option would be a worm farm. We've been unsuccessful with our worm farm because we don't have enough vegetable cuttings because between us the chickens and the rabbit we don't and the dogs we don't actually end up with that many scraps um so we didn't weirdly we didn't really have enough to feed them and it, it didn't really work out as well as we'd hoped but you can have a worm farm they don't smell we had it sitting in the kitchen and it was a sort of happy environment for them but we just didn't just didn't work out for us and the liquid comes out the bottom and it sort of works in the same way if you'd like worm pets um, sort of thing that that freaks out visitors when you're saying, oh, by the way, that's that's our worms there. And it marks you up as a that's sort of a next step of hippiedom, I think, to, to have the worms in the kitchen. But that might be worth, and they're, they're just sort of a, a bucket contraption that you you can build yourself, right? Um, can you do the same with nettles without water? I don't know. I I would suspect you could, particularly as nettles are so plentiful. So, Hilary, have you tried nettles without water? Never tried with nettles. No, I haven't either. Um, Nessa, I think that's your, it's your job to find out and see if it works and report back. But uh, it's, it'd be the same process and the, I imagine it'd be, it work. And, and whatever's left over the sludge, if there is any sludge, can just go in the compost heap or in the bottom of a new bed or whatever. Right. We have a question from earlier on. Uh, Stephen and Emma were asking about the asparagus and if it's from the polytunnel. Mm. Seamus, do you want to take the asparagus? Oh, away? of course, yeah. Um, so the, the, the asparagus is, is from outside, would you believe? Um, and this is from um, a bed, well, uh, I say a bed, a random scattering of plants we put in, oh goodness, six, seven years ago. Um, and we've not been terribly good at, you know, keeping on top of where they are. And so other things are growing around them, but they're still going and they're still going strong. And we don't get a massive harvest, but we've had, you know, a, a good dozen or so decent stalks. We've been enjoying them on pizza this year. That has been absolutely amazing. Just to harvest it straight from the garden, chuck it on. Bingo. There you go. Um, so, yes, the, the, these are outdoor ones. We've never tried them in the polytunnel, have we? That, that's never been a, a thing we've, we've had a go at. But, um, it's something we're keen to try, um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a space thing for us. So we have two big polytunnels and one of them had seedlings in it at the beginning of the year and still has the staging and it needs to come out and then we've got more space and then they could go in. Um, and the two smaller polytunnels, um, they're, they're forever full of tomatoes. So we've never quite found the right spot, but we, we've got a new asparagus bed outside, which we started last year and it's kept more wheat free than any other we've tried. So. We lost 30 plants under the lawn one year because we just didn't just got distracted and off they went. Um, and this year we've just filled the gaps with more plants, the ones that didn't come up. And um, so hopefully next year, the year after, we'll have a, a rhubarb's worth of asparagus and we'll uh, we'll have it coming out of our ears. But it's one of those things that I, I swear I could eat my body weight off every day. I just love it. And it's a love-hate thing, isn't it? But it's just... I mean, so yes, people do grow them in the tunnel and uh, you should get an earlier harvest. Does anyone have asparagus in a tunnel? No, po polytunnel growing is one of those things we're sort of, we're finding our feet with. There's things we know that we do right and there's things we know 
that don't work out, but we're not quite sure why they don't work out. So it's a, every year is a sort of trial and error thing, but then the weather is so different and <laughs> it's just never ending, you know, hoping for the best. And, but yeah, but you, you, it does do fine outside. It ju it's just later than, than elsewhere. Yeah. Any other question? How's your, how's your growing year been? How's, what are you eating at the moment? What are you wanting to grow in autumn and winter? How, how are things going? Hilary, do you want to go ahead and tell us all about it? <laughs> I'm, I've not got an awful lot, but I have just started harvesting Marsh 2 peas. And I, I've grown Marsh 2 peas for years, but a couple of years ago, I found a variety called Shiraz, which is a purple Marsh 2 pea. Lovely and tasty more prolific than any pea I have ever grown before and uh, so now it's on my list it gets grown every year but we've just had our first helping of marsh two peas and they're yeah. doing really well are they outside or in a in a tunnel oh, outside I I haven't got a tunnel. well do you remember when you sold them by any chance um probably February mm -hmm. I tend to grow everything because I've not got a polytunnel or a greenhouse, I grow. I start everything just about off in the house, yeah. or the conservatory, yeah. or the back porch, which is north facing, or the kitchen, or the living room. <laughs> so these, I think, were started off. I can't remember whether I put them in the in in the conservatory or whether I actually put them straight out into a cold frame because they don't need it very hot. Yeah. Um, Ours are, they're, they're slow this year. They've picked up now with the warm weather. They're finally getting going. Uh, uh, we, we're growing Shiraz as well. And they're, they're, the plants are about this tall now. They've not yet set flower, but they're not far off. Um, but they, they were slow and they were, when we planted them out, they were, it, it's, we planted them out just before uh, there was a storm for three days. And, you know, they didn't really like that at all. Um, so we supplemented them with later planting. So hopefully soon we'll have a, an exploding pea tent that'll be that sounds really wrong <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> but I came out wrong yes yeah, so I, I did a succession as well so I've got the second lot coming along but I was surprised that they seem to be being very slow and then suddenly I saw a flower and that was only a week ago and now I've, I've harvested them they oh. suddenly come really fast that's that's amazing uh Clifford I'm really sorry to hear about all your snail issues um I mean ducks is the obvious solution to that you, you must keep a flock of ducks and they'll eat them all if you encourage them um we've heard good things about nematodes which is a it's a soil organism it comes to you in powdered form and you dilute it with water and you add it back to the soil and apparently it takes care of at least slugs snail I'm not sure what it does for Snails are hard, aren't they? Um, for us, ducks are the are the solution, and going around collecting them and rehoming them to the sl to the the part of the garden where the ducks live, and then sometimes they they live in the hedge, and sometimes they live in the duck. Um, we're sort of making our and we make our peas with sacrificial plants and losing some, but oh, what, was, that, was that was that nematodes? Did you say? Yeah, yeah. we we've not tried them, um, but we know. We know other people who have. I think it's slug rather than snail. Um, but it, it sounds like a less nasty version than pretty much all other. It's still it's still pretty sinister, you know. A anything you do to get rid of whatever it is that's bothering you is not going to be a nice process. No. I like the snails, but I don't like them eating my Brussels <laughs> sprouts. I know. Same. Same. Um, M M Michelle just put some excellent tips in the, the chat there. Uh, gu guarding peas from pests by putting gorse cuttings around the base. Ooh. That's amazing. Um, so Michelle, do, do you have an abundance of gorse that you're desperately trying to get rid of? And, and that's the, one, one of the ways to, to do it. That sounds about anything spiky is quite a nice a good good deterrent, isn't it? That's a that's a tempting thing. Um sorry, Hilary, I can see you. I I um put a little collar, a plastic collar from a um squash bottle or something like that, or a pot bottle, and I put 
that round just about every small plant I put out. And um, then I will often put the ferric phosphates, slug pellets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. three or four tiny little pellets in each inside each collar. Oh, and I find that's yeah. pretty effective. And yeah. slug pellets then last for years. Yeah. Because you're not scattering them about willy nilly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the 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 the, the plastic collars. We've never experimented with them because we we don't have any plastic bottles coming in like that at all. We don't drink anything that that comes in them. Um, and I, I asking other people to bring you their 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 plastic bottles is a recipe for the disaster because then you know <laughs> we're drowning in everything else. So it's we, we've managed a good supply of wine bottles, beer bottles, and jam jars from the community, but plastic bottles seems a <laughs> suddenly there'll be you know lots, lots of them but that's, a, that's a really I've, I've seen that so you basically take sort of if this were your plastic bottle you cut them off like this and yeah usually if it's a two litre bottle it usually yeah. makes a couple of yeah a couple of rings I mean I have collected them over the years I never have enough and I because I don't drink I don't drink pop or mm -hmm. anything like that but occasionally people do give me them as yeah. well it's amazing is it several years yeah. Once, once you, once you make it known that you are after people's junk, it just appears by the back door, and it's. You, you can use milk bottles as well. We don't drink that either. <laughs> but yeah, but anything. Milk bottles make really nice watering bottles as well, don't they? If you just poke some holes in the top, and it's a nice and easy thing to to hold. But um, Stephen, Anna, eggshell, wood ash, and copper. Um, do they actually work for you? We've tried all three, and it makes. I think I'm convinced it makes no bugger difference to the. <laughs> snails and slugs at all they just slither over it and laugh at us and um, the wood ash has worked for us and the eggshells work for us um and i've also heard about um sheep's fleece as well putting some of that round so obviously it can work as a mulch but it also works as a barrier yeah we're, we're, we're trying we've not tried copper because we we're not copper rich right. <laughs> we don't have a copper mine in the back garden yeah. so <laughs> we're, we're trying sheep this year um over the winter we put it in the in the polytunnel a sheep's fleece <laughs> um we got very lucky that a friend had had spare fleeces because the wool price is so low that you know they were going to burn them and we thought oh hang on but we haven't done enough with them yet it's one of those things that it's sitting there and it's not going to go off but i suspect like the gorse there's it's a similar texture thing isn't it that stops them that's the thinking about it um but if they do get under it you can't see them and you're you know it could, could be a <laughs> and nessa uses crushed eggshell and coffee grounds as well how's that going um, it's going okay. We use it in the polytunnel, and there are not a lot of snails, so it's just enough of a deterrent till they get going. And usually, a lot of the things we're putting in are plugs to start with, so they're they're reasonably big. I think if you seed things from scratch and they sit for a long time, very small in the cold, it's a disaster. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're right. That plugs are a good way. Not a great way of deterring beasties, but a good way because the plants are, by the time you put them out, they're already bigger and sturdier and they stand more of a chance like these. Um, the, the, this case, it's now big enough that if something came and munched most of its leaves, it, it would always leave the middle stalk because they never eat those. Um, it would be sturdy enough to grow more leaves, even if it lost those ones, same with pigeons and things. But if I'd grown that from seed, um, probably wouldn't, wouldn't work out. Um, yeah. <laughs> Clifford has rehomed the snails. That's apparently they're <laughs> like, like pigeons, they can come back from quite a distance, or like mice. So you might have to take them for a drive down the beach or <laughs> sort of take them for a scenic, ch ch chuck them into a duck, duck hedge. And, yeah, uh, I, I heard they can find their way back from about two miles. <laughs> that's what I read somewhere. <laughs> And I think at that point you have to be proud of them and you yeah. know, love them for their <laughs> tenacity. Um, we confuse them by throwing them over the fence. Yeah. Um, uh, Kath is saying this is this is their first year growing things so far. Pak choy, cabbage, and spinach is growing well, starting to be eaten. Lost a lot to the snails. Yeah, snails are this this universal. 
I'm, I'm convinced that it's like, like so much about growing food, it's less about what you can do to get rid of them and more about what you can do to your space so they don't want to be there. So if you can find a way to, to have bits of your space that they're more attracted to and send them there, that's probably a better solution than attacking them specifically because every time you attack one pest, another one takes its place. So it's, it's one of those things that takes a while to work out, but it's one of those permaculture things, isn't it? That you, you try and make the space attractive to the kind of wildlife that's going to eat your snails and unattractive to the snails themselves. So if there's ways of luring the birds that want to eat your snails and giving them a nice chunk of rock that they can smash them on, they, they're going to take care of that for you. You know, thrushes, I think, in particular, enjoy eating snails. I think I've seen them do that. So it's, it's thinking about the whole thing as a, um, as a bigger sort of ecological thing, isn't it? That you're not, not just trying to look at that one thing, but look at the, the whole thing and why it's doing what it's doing. And that's very easy to say with a, a big garden where you, you've done years of this, but I think even in a small space, think about what is, what is attractive to it, what isn't, and what you can do to bring in, you know, have, having your bird feeders near your vegetables might mean you end up with some self-seeded random things because the birds drop them, but it also means that they might be eating some. I've heard good things about people introducing ladybugs to their polytunnels um, to eat aphids and other things. We've not done that, but apparently you can buy them and they arrive by post and <laughs> like worms arriving by post. It's, it's something that, that folks do. I just collect them from outside and take them into the conservatory. And it's surprising, you know, just two or three and mm -hmm. suddenly you've got loads of larvae. Yeah. Uh, we always struggle with our, our chilies, our indoor, our indoor vegetables, so chilies, peppers, aubergines. Sometimes we try cucumber and a tomato and they're always overrun by little, little white bugs, little aphids or something. Um, but on a sunny day, if you put the plants outside, um, leave them for a day or two in a sunny spell, um, they come back clean and beautiful and if that's been taken care of. But, um, Faye did an experiment with taking, marking the shells of snails before you took them for a walk and they didn't come back. Ooh, that's reassuring. How far did you, um, how far did you walk your snails? Only about 300 metres down the road. Um, so I was surprised they didn't come back or maybe I just didn't find the ones again. Yeah. But I, 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 I firmly believe if I want hedgehogs, I've got to leave slugs and things for them to eat. So I just, Plant, sacrificial plants for them. Yeah, that, that's, that's the thing with all of it, isn't it? It's about the, the bigger ecosystem and it's about balancing your, your, your desire for plants and food and so on with everything else. And I think we're, you know, as a species, we're partially in the mess we're in because so long it's been about what, what we want and not what, what works overall. That's, that's a sort of preachy thing, but you know what I mean? It's thinking about it all. Um, Angela is having problems with sparrows. Um, they have, they're nesting in the hedge, they've eaten the lettuce and the beetroot, um, have to replant and buy some nets. Yeah, that's, it's a tricky one. We, we, last year we bought a lot of EnviroMesh as protection from birds and butterflies. And it was expensive, but it works really well. And it seems really, really sturdy and like we're gonna be reusing it for forever, but like in a good way forever, not in a, in a bad way forever. Um, it's very fine mesh, um, but it's it's made in a sturdy way. So you just cut it to the, the size you want. And for most of our crops, we don't have hoops or anything. We put it on the ground quite loosely, weigh it down with stones and the plants push it up. So it means sometimes we don't, don't get perfectly straight plants um, if we've left it too tight, but it means we don't have to build contraptions either. So. Um, it might be worth looking at this. It's called EnviroMesh. I'll put it in the, in the chat. That's worked well. Um, lots of people have good results with builder's netting, builder's mesh, which is a sort of scaffold scaffolding netting. That tends to work quite well. It's much cheaper, but I think it's, it's bigger netting than, than this stuff. And for us, butterflies are... Uh, we're delighted to see them, but also they want to eat all our brassicas, and then we get no flowers. And then I get very sad. 
it's amazing what a small mesh a butterfly can get through. So if you've got sort of a, a one centimetre mesh, you know, you think a butterfly won't get through that, but it does. So it has to be very fine mesh to stop a butterfly yeah. getting through. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we, we, we learnt about the, the necessity for, for netting the hard way. We had a, a lovely, glorious crop of, of Brussels sprouts that we were going to overwinter. And then, you know, December, January, the, the pigeons feasted on them and, and left nothing. And yep, <laughs> lesson learned the hard way. <laughs> But and, and it's back to the hedgehogs, we didn't really resent them for it because we're glad they're here and we're glad they're helping take care of everything. And P pigeon is one of our cat's favorite snacks, so we, we feel like <laughs> the Brussels sprouts were coming <laughs> not to us but back to the household in a, in a way as well. Um, Nessa uses the environment too, and sections of blue water pipe. Oh, tell us, tell us about that. How, what do you do with them? Where do you get them? Um, well, you just buy, I don't know where we got it from, but I buy a roll of blue water pipe, which mm -hmm. you can get different diameters. And I just, you don't need to put stakes in the ground. You can just push it in. So you cut it to whatever height you want to create your bed with. No dig would work really well. I've actually got a few raised beds. And I just make a mini polytunnel or a mini EnviroMesh mm -hmm. cover for whatever I'm planting. And that keeps the net off there plant. Brilliant. That's that's a really, really good idea, isn't it? It's uh, There's so much, I think in gardening and in growing food, there's so much stuff that is sold to you as you need this specific thing to, to do something with. And there's so much you can just make yourself from stuff you or your neighbours have lying around. And But it takes time to think about that and it takes, takes brain space and it takes knowing people and, and all the rest of that. So yeah so i think there's a, a sort of a, a few minutes left where are you at with your you, you as a group where are you at with your your plans for autumn and winter what are you what are you going to spend the next month doing other than harvesting things what are you what are you doing to prep for for the dark season While you're having to think about that, um, Vicky plants mostly in old tires, um, breaks up some old dog crates, nice, pops the section on top of the tires, that's really good. Um, yeah, and you could probably attach netting to that quite easily as well, because it's already a, a structure for that. That's a that's a really good thing. Again, it, and it's reusing things you have sitting around, that kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> making it self plant for winter. Yeah, that's totally. And it's kind of the last thing you want to be thinking about now. You want to sit in the garden and, if you're me, eat pizza and drink beer and just enjoy the bit of sunshine we have. But yeah, totally. Be it's be kind to your future self. You know, think about your your future self. And when we was putting that together, we we're thinking about how we are we're sort of constantly living in in three seasons. And with meals we eat, we 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 eat from the here and now. We eat the things that are are there. Um, but we also eat from the past, you know, we eat the, the jams and the frozen things. So we, we thank our past selves for being with it enough to, to do that. But at the same time, we're having to think about our future selves and not eat all of it at once, but make sure that, you know, our autumn and winter selves are... Uh, it sounds like a, like a weird sort of hippie circular thing, but really do... It's, it's an act of kindness to yourself and an act of self-care to feed yourself next year or later this year or whatever. It's, a, it's something that's worth taking time out to do and worth thinking about. And it's, it's, a, it's a way of looking after yourself and your family and your friends. And, you know, that's a, that's a nice thing. Um, brilliant. Um, ah, water, cold water pipe on eBay, perfect. Um, Alison is trying out kale for the first time. Oh, they are just amazing. Put them outside as well if you got if you got room for them. Don't just put them in the tunnel, and try out all the different varieties because they all taste different and they're all amazing. Um, I brought you this one, the red ration, but I think we're growing about ten different kinds. And they're, they're broadly there. There's leaves that look like this, which is the kind of leaf I, I held up as well. It'll grow. It's not the same thing, but it'll grow into this kind of shape, type leaf. You know, with the scraggly bits. And then there's the sort of big flat thing like a cavallonero, and then there's the really curly kind as well. But grow lots of different ones, put them outside and 
eat them when they're small. Um, I much prefer them when they're when they're really young. Um, this size tastes amazing. Um, that size is nice too, but the little ones are just snack snack food. They are perfect. Um, Ah, Stephen and Anna love planning their, their Christmas gifts. It's exactly that, isn't it? You're suddenly thinking, oh, um, who, who, who's, getting, who's getting rhubarb wine this year? Who has proved themselves to be really worthy? <laughs> who's getting the really nice wine? Um, who, who, who do we like but is not worthy of the fancy wine? They get a nice jam and you sort of I have fun thinking about that too and always make more than, than we need. Uh, Sutherland Kale is fantastic, isn't it? Um, Real Seeds is a, is a good company to shout out for. Um, someone recently brought some, some uh, Sutherland Kale seeds back to us. They got some in a seed swap, so I, I have some more now. It's a kind of kale, I keep saying it tastes boring in the summer, but amazing in the winter, because in the summer it just tastes green and you have so much other green, but in the winter it tastes green. And it's just the, the, the wonderful thing and it really, really gets going. It's a, it's a nice, nice thing that's yeah Sutherland the, the Sutherland fancy the um the Highland Good Food conversation are they still call that or the Highland Good Food Network it's they, they changed names recently I can't remember they have a map of where you can add yourself if you're growing Sutherland kale because they want to track who's growing it and how long you've been growing it. it's an interactive map do add yourself to it it's quite a nice thing to and save the seeds and, and, and what, what was that it's the Highland Good Food Network Okay. Um, follow them. If, if, if you use social media, follow them, go to their things. They seem like a really good bunch. Um, and they, they, they now have an interactive map of local food producers and community gardens and things like that as well. They're trying to create space for sort of highland white things so you don't feel like you're alone. Um, Hilary, sorry. I can... <laughs> I've uh, tried something called asparagus kale and I thought it was horrible. I don't mm. like caballero nero either. <laughs> this, it's too strong a flavour. Yeah. I love dwarf green curly kale. Mm -hmm. So where does Sutherland kale come on that spectrum? Um, more like dwarf green. It's a fairly... I'm not sure I have the right words to describe. It's, it's, it's milder, like it doesn't taste strongly like caballero nero. Um, with Cavallo Nero, I found that I don't like the middle stalk, but I like the leafy bits just from uh, something about the, the texture and the stalk that just got a bit, bit too much. Um, asparagus kale we tried and it didn't really do very much, so we've not bothered doing it again. I couldn't tell you what it tastes like because I'm not sure we got anywhere with it. Do you remember, Seamus? Very coarse. Yeah. It, you know, fairly tough and rather nondescript. Right. Yeah, the, the, the Sutherland, it's the good kind of bland, I would say. And it's the kind of bland that is boring in the summer when you have lots of more exciting things to eat, but so welcome in the winter when you just want a, a taste of fresh. Um, it's, it's more boring than the Red Russian, which is, you know, the kale of kales. <laughs> um, but it's worth, it's worth trying, I think. It's, yeah, it's, it's not one of the ones that are... It's a beginner scale in terms of kale enjoyment. <laughs> yeah. Fennel, how are we getting on with fennel? We, we don't grow fennel because we don't really like it. So if we, we tried it once or twice and then gave it away. So we thought we'd stop growing that. But how are you guys getting on with your fennel? I grow bronze fennel because it's so mm. much prettier. Uh, and in my last garden, I had one plant of bronze fennel and it never seeded anywhere. In this garden, I'm finding them everywhere all the time. I'm having to dig them up. The trouble is, unless you get them really, really small, mm. they die on you because they've got a big, deep root and, and they yeah. don't like transplanting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, quite a lot of them just have to go on the compost heap, I'm afraid. Uh, that's that's not always a bad thing, isn't it? Because it's still coming back to your ecosystem and still still has a, has a purpose then as well, doesn't it? So, yeah. Last time we talked about compost very briefly, and we got a question afterwards um, about local compost and people buying it locally rather than imported. And I've, I've been mulling this over, and I really can't think of anywhere in Highland where you could get compost that doesn't come on a lorry other than you making it yourself. 
Um, I know lots of other local authorities collect the green, the, the brown bins, and then there's compost you can go collect, but I don't think we have anything like that. It must be a, because of the size of the local area type thing. And so there's nothing, we've not found anything where that's possible, which is a, it's a real shame that that's not, that's not happening. If anyone, has anyone got any ideas for where to get local, local compost, wherever our, your, our local is? What about the sewage works? Sometimes what about they, the, what about the sewage works? Sometimes they do compost. Oh, oh interesting. There was a thing in I saw this thing on the internet, you know, the way all, all terrible stories are. And it was, it was specifically about the US, I think, and about there being compost, consumer compost, compost you buy in the shop. And it had the phrase they used was biosolids added to it, which was essentially sewage stuff. And it meant there was a lot of, oh God, I can't remember the details, but it was something like it added, um, it added something to it that you didn't want in your soil, but because it came, it came through the sewage stuff broadly, the, 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 the waste, that it then went into your plants, but the, the compost companies didn't tell you about it. So people didn't know they were, they thought they were adding something really good to the garden. And it turns out they were adding, I don't know, metals or weed killer or whatever thing that's, that they really, really didn't want about. I'd never heard about that before. It was on The Guardian fairly recently. Um, Biosolids was the word to, to look for. I have no idea if this is a specifically American thing because they have different rules and regulations or um, but something sort of, save it in the back of your mind in case you're ever, ever come across that. But. It, it can be really difficult sourcing stuff. I know somebody with a market garden and they got some, horse manure, mm. well rotted horse manure, mm -hmm. put it on their plants and everything died. Yeah. And it turned out to be that the horses had been fed on hay that had got weed yeah. killer in it yeah. and the weed killer is so persistent yeah. it comes out in the poo and it's still active. Yeah it's a, it's a big thing in in the compost market at the moment and the big compost companies aren't doing anything about it. Uh, Charles Dowding talks about it a lot as a particular type of weed killer that's makes all the plants shrivel up really nastily when they get going. Um, and you can't tell before you've got your bunch what it's gonna do. Um, so we've now, we mostly switched over to the, um, the Daleford compost from the Lake District, um, which is, is done well for us, um, but it comes on a lorry, we have to buy it on a pallet, you know, and it's made from bracken, comfrey and sheep's wool. Um, they, they, they make it, and it's, Bracken comfrey and sheep's wool. Surely there's a highland market for doing the same kind of thing. Particularly, I'm thinking sheep farmers where the wool isn't worth it anymore. This would be a, an alternative to do it, but you'd need someone to do it on a fairly large scale for it to be worth it. So um, talk to your farming neighbors and see who's who can be persuaded to, to do it. But yeah, it's just something I, I wanted to because there are comments about it afterwards. I, I wanted to raise it and address it and see if anyone else had any other ideas for that beyond make your own, get it from the, get on a lorry and be careful what you buy, you know, that's, and even stuff that's because it's, it comes from the horses rather than the, it's, it's such a, such a long way back, even sort of tracing organic stuff might not get you to the, the source and it's a difficult, difficult one, isn't it? One of the, one of the things with horses as well is if they've had any medication or anything like that and you happen to pick up yeah. You know, it stays in the in the two. Yeah. yeah, it's it's hard, isn't it? And it's the as ever, it's it's the payoff between a, a free resource or a resource that you have access to, and a resource you have to buy in, or you know, what are you? Is, is growing things in medicated poo better than not growing things at all? And what are you able to do? It's like growing in tires, isn't it? Some people don't like it at all because of the, the stuff leaching out of the tires. Some people are fine with it because it's the compromise they make. I think so much about so much about life, but so much about gardening is a compromise, isn't it? It's about weighing up your your, your time, your energy, your money with what you'd like to do and seeing seeing where it gets you, I think. But, ah. Well, planning on using a composting toilet, anyone use the, the compost, the humanure, 
on your veggies. Um, I haven't. I know. I know people on the internet who have, but has anyone got any experience with that? I was interested to ask just because what you said about the human, um, you know, yeah. stuff that can go into it. Yeah, I think if you if you haven't already joined the Permaculture Association and get the Permaculture magazine, that would be my for the first stopping point for looking through the bag issues and the bag catalogue of, of what's going on there. I know they, they have features on that kind of stuff. Yeah, fairly regularly, but yeah, Stephen and I are only putting we on their compost. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's I, I know our veggies. Um, they, they grow in at least some cat poo because we can't stop the buggers from doing it and you don't always you can't always tell you know sometimes you find it when you're digging things up and we sort of ma made our peace with that and hope for the best but i hate finding cat poo <laughs> it's not it's not nice and it can be a dangerous thing you know so you have to yeah i love cats but I, I hate that they go in my beds <laughs> but you know it's, it's it's a nicely it's a nice surface for them isn't it the the moment you build a new veg bed, that's that's their primary spot, isn't it? That's, and I, I try I try not to think of them peeing because you can't tell at all. So I pretend they don't do that there. But they just do that elsewhere. It's, it's safer, so like yeah, um, yeah. Vicky's saying tires work for you in the space you have. It's exactly that, isn't it? It's about has to be about compromises and figuring out. It's it's back to infrastructure, isn't it? And working out what works for you, your space your life, your ambitions, your... But I think life is like that, isn't it? Trying to figure out what you want and how to make it happen in a way that doesn't hurt others. So, but, right? Um, so other than thinking about winter, um, last last couple of minutes, what, what, are you, what are you doing in the next month? So we have one more of these workshops planned in about a month's time, we haven't set a date yet, but it'll be the beginning of, of July when we'll be talking about what we're sowing then, what we're, how our winter preparations are going and what's happened since we, we saw you last. But um, my plan for the next month is to start sowing things that we'll be eating in August, in August, in autumn and into winter. Um, it's to remind myself that I have to be kind to my future self because otherwise I'm going to be really miserable come autumn and it's to start making a lot of booze and jam basically and cakes and crumbles and which I'll be very grateful for come winter but what are you guys and 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 buying things like putting in things like asparagus plants which aren't immediately for this future season but for my future self you know and fruit bushes and things like that so what what are you doing over the next month. Trying to keep on top of the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's what that's why I like having the, the, the plants, the plucked plants in a different section because they then become a different thing from the weeds. They are they live in the grow house and they'll be fine or on a windowsill or whatever. And I can think of them as two separate activities rather than doing it you know, fighting it all at the same time. Um, yeah. Anything else in particular anyone's planning on? I've just taken two hours this morning trying to water as much as I can before my water butts run out. Yeah. So yeah, if it's, it's raining in the next week, I'll be on to tap water. Yeah, it's a tricky thing, isn't it? Um, it's so great when the weather's like that, and it's so terrible when the weather's like this. It's just, it's this never ending thing. We, we try to, we try to water in the morning and I say we, Seamus does the watering. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, but I, I think watering in the morning is one of those things you can do about slugs and snails because they come out at night. And if it's a dry environment, they're less likely to bother you than if it's a, an environment you've just wetted because, you know, they really like that. But then do you have time in the morning? Do you have you know, are you busy? Do you start work at eight? Um, there's no time to... So again, it's about your life and, and how it works out. Um, Stephen and Anna are learning the new garden, experimenting with what works where, plants decide to polytunnel. Yeah, totally, and water management, exactly. It never stops, does it? It's this... Planning is a really big part of, of gardening as well, isn't it? It's a really big part of, of that. And thinking about 
not just this season, but future seasons as well. And really thinking about where you, it's a commitment thing, isn't it? If, you, if you're going to commit to having food next year, you kind of need to put it in motion now. And yeah, it's to, to make a conscious decision that you're going to, you're going to be growing food, damn it. And that's, you're going to be doing it. Yeah, exactly that. Um, Michelle is keeping salad growing. Yeah, hoping for tomato. I know, hoping for them, hoping it last year it was a largely green tomato year for us. And we're really hoping for a, a glut of red ones this year. That will be, that'll be very welcome. Planting more carrots, me too. Um, planting entire, that's that's a good thing. Good thing as well. I'm, I'm yet to re sow some of my parsnips that didn't all come up. So that's up on the list as well. But do you have any tips for parsnips? Because they germinate terribly every year and sometimes yeah. I don't get any. Yeah, they are. I, in my experience, they're very slow and irregular. And I resent how much space they take for a really long period of time. But I love them at Christmas and I cannot bear to not have them. Um, and once they're there, I, I never quite sure how, when to harvest them because if you leave them too long, they become giant beasts and they're very hard to get out. And then you're turning your no dig garden into a dig garden because you can't get them out any other way. But if you harvest them early and they're really small, um, you don't get as much mileage for your, your investment. And No, parsnips are, are one of those things I'm... I, I don't care about them enough to find out how to do them really well. I think is the <laughs> that's the honest answer there. I tried sowing some in root trainers this mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And even there the germination was awful. You know, it would, they were they were in inside in the in the back porch, so they weren't too hot, but yeah. not too cold, because they're supposed to like it warmer, aren't they, to germinate? Yeah. Yeah. And and still the germination was terrible. Uh, Stephen and Anna are asking, do we chit our parsnips? Do you mean like soak the seeds before you plant them? I've never bothered, but I know people do that for quite a lot of things, isn't it? You, you soak them like peas and things, you soak them overnight and then they get going. Um, I've never bothered because I figure it's usually cold and wet and miserable, so they're sort of self-soaking <laughs> by the time you get them out. Um, I don't know, it might, might be worth trying to see if that makes a like on, on kitchen towel or something like that, right? And You're supposed to keep them until they actually start to germinate. And yeah. then so I did that once. I can't remember whether it was effective or not, but I didn't do it again. So either it wasn't effective or it was far too much trouble. <laughs> but Faye has a, a good tip there as well. Old gardeners used to put a plank of wood over the row after sowing parsnips. It's worked sometimes for me. Um, I think if I did that, I totally forgot that I have them and I'd never remove the plank of woods and they'd all die. <laughs> it's one of those things, isn't it? That I know I'm I know I won't remember. So it'd be disastrous if if I tried that. But if someone's more organized or has the brain space to, to remember those things, then I guess it, it must be something it would create a cold and damp environment, wouldn't it? It must be to do with water retention and and that kind of stuff, yeah. I think a lot of the, the 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 old wise things and the old gardeners things there's so much there's always a grain of truth in them but often it's not about why they tell you it's what they're doing it, it, it's usually sort of a different thing but when you start thinking about it and wondering why that works it's it's a really good it can work really really well but often in a, I find in a different way than why people are nominally doing it that's Right. Is there anything else from anyone else? Any other questions? Any other concerns? What are you? I'm I'm looking forward to to eating all the stuff I've showed you, minus the asparagus that I have now eaten. But the rest, um, I'm putting on a a bucket of rhubarb wine. I think that's definitely a task for this weekend. And rhubarb ketchup is that's going to be happening very soon. Do you ever try any new stuff, different stuff that you've never grown before? And yeah, I, I, you grow I, anything that's slightly exotic. Uh, yes, no. So I, I, I have five watermelon seedlings. <laughs> they're never going to fruit, but I love the idea of growing them and telling people. So they're about, they're like my cucumbers. They're like this size, and they look very similar to cucumbers, flowers, from, seedlings, from what I can tell. Um, I need to make space in the tunnel so they have somewhere to go. 
Um, so that, that's my most exotic thing. Um, every year I try and grow more globe artichokes and I never grow enough, but one day I will have a massive, massive patch of them. So, um, and other than that, new things, I think celery was a new thing for us last year. I, I don't like it, Seamus does, so it's one of those things. We're, we're not going to eat sort of jointly in, in massive meals, but it's a, it's a welcome thing. Um, a new thing this year for us is quince. We put a quince tree in two years ago and it's finally flowering. So that's that's a new thing, but a new thing we thought of a while back. And we've moved our fig and our kiwi, which have never done anything, out of the polytunnel into pots outside. And the kiwi is not dead and we have three baby figs. And I can't tell you how excited I am about the possibility of, of figs. Um, but in terms of actual sort of ground vegetables, I think we've tried most things now. It's a case of like trying new varieties, like, like you were saying about the peas, you know, trying different types of peas and working out what works for you. And I think for us, it's we're trying to learn about flowers and trying to grow more and different flowers and to try and learn to recognize them. And that that's sort of where I think most of our uh, sort of I want to learn you is, is going to be going into flowers and that's... flowers to eat or just flowers just or... just flowers and having ridiculous abundance of joyful color in the in the space and figuring out where they can go at the edge of the veg beds and how big they're going to get and I with vegetables I feel like I have this I have what I feel like an intuitive understanding of them but that's nonsense it's just because I've done it a lot and I I now know what they want and why they're not happy and that kind of thing. It's, you know, it just feels like for most of them, I don't have to think about it anymore. I just know what they want and I can identify them and they're really small and I, I, I get vegetables. But flowers, I really don't. I can identify in a handful and I can't tell how big they're going to get. So I know the packet says it, but it's never, it's never true. So I still, I still can't look at the tiny seedling and think about how much space it's going to need. And um, I'd like to get better with flowers I think is my ed edible and otherwise and I think of them as something again it's, it's like the hedgehog isn't it it's the it's the ecosystem things so I'd like to try and ha have have more of that but, yeah ground if, there, if there's nothing else um high, highland seedlings come send me an email if there's any questions um I'll be a bit slow to respond I'm I'm always slow after these workshops because it takes me a a few days to, to get my brain space back but it's it's been lovely seeing you all um thank you for joining in um hope it all works out and remember to have a look at the the LAG learning center website for lovely courses lots of other exciting things and um, yeah hopefully in, in, in the future times we can meet and do this in a garden which would be yeah. much better be Excellent. all righty and 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 bring some of your produce along next time we'll, we'll all have a show and tell of you if you can. Cool. Excellent. And Vicky, I'll pop the both box out. Brilliant. Then... We'll come by later on. Awesome. I'm, I'm not very much today. That's my that's the excitement for the rest of the day. No, that was really good. Thank you. Cool. Excellent. Right. right. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye.